All right, it looks like I'm live. Hello, hello, hello everybody. Welcome to my studio here in San Diego. Uh, let's see. We got a chat here. If, uh, if you guys can see me here, why don't you um, chime in and say hello on the chat? Let me know where you're where you're at. All right, looks like you've got a comment there. All right, I'll wait a minute or two for uh, people to log in and let me know that they're here. Looks like we got a few, got a couple of eyes on here. <clears throat> All right, as you can see, I'm coming to you live from Photoshop. I live inside Photoshop, apparently. Um, yeah, Tammy Johnson. Hey, hi, Tammy. Okay, great. We got a few in here already. Eleven. Okay, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, today I will be doing a uh, caricature sketch from start to finish. Hopefully, I'll finish uh, from one of my favorite movies. Where'd it go here? Let's see. Let's get my photo reference up on screen. There we go. A little shop of horrors action here. If you guys haven't seen Little Shop of Horrors, it's just delightful. It's a musical comedy starring Rick Moranis and Ellen Green. And I've always wanted to do a caricature from that. I just, uh, it was a big part of my childhood. I loved that musical. I don't really like musicals, but I liked Little Shop of Horrors. All right, maybe I can um, make that a little smaller. And, all righty. Size this here. Okay, it's a little small, but uh, I want to be able to fit everything on the screen here. Yeah, actually, not all do here. I'll zoom in a little bit. Sorry, I probably should have arranged this all ahead of time. Okay, let's go ahead and get started here. Now I'm going to start with just the uh, the big shapes, um, just because I'm kind of starting from scratch here. I always start from the biggest shapes first to try to figure out my plan of attack. And Rick Moranis has this great sort of triangle shape to his head, this view. I never do profile views. I mean, not never, but almost never. It's uh, And profiles are just one of the greatest, you know, friends to the caricature artist because of all the... Uh, the changes that go on in the face, especially with someone with you know a big nose, weak chin, big back of the head. Alrighty, let's see here. So we've got questions here. Hi everybody. Have you seen the original? Yes, Bob, I have seen the original stage play a couple times actually. I was actually in it in college. Um, that's a story for another time though. <laughs> feed me some caricatures. Okay. You can see more here. I'm just trying to get his body posture and just the distribution of the weight on his face. It's sort of, you know, hunched over. He's kind of a meek character. From this profile view, it almost seems like he has a snout, like a, like a dog or an animal or something, with very, with no chin. Hey, Robert Bauer. Hey, everybody. We got a party going on here. All right, a lot of people watching. I think for the, uh, you know, before I go too far on Seymour here, I'm gonna draw Audrey next to him. Um, I love being able to draw two people next to each other playing 
each other off the other person's like features and, <clears throat> and exaggerations. So I can try to find ways that, you know, make the other person really contrast and stand out with the first person. So let's see. So she has this great helmet of hair, obviously, but I think I'll start with the skull regardless when the hair is such an integral part of her features. And it may be hard to tell from the photo, but, you know, I'm familiar with the movie, so, you know, she just has this huge mouth when she sings. She just opens her mouth up really wide, so I'm going to give her a really large mouth, much larger than Seymour's by comparison. It's super skinny neck. In fact, I'm going to, we're running out of room here, I'm going to shrink her down. Any questions yet? Uh, yeah, if, yeah. If anyone has any questions about the process or anything, just let me know. I'll try to check in every now and then. I have to shrink Audrey down even a little more. I want to include more of her, uh, uh, you know, shoulder, chest area in the picture. Oh, thanks, Mark. Watching the Proco caricature course, appreciate that. Steve asks, what kind of software do you use to superimpose yourself over the big screen? Um, OBS, Open Broadcast Software, a lot of gamers use that. Uh, and I've got a green screen behind me, actually, so that actually allows me to do the superimposing. Um, the green screen is required. Um, whoops. You know, I bought the green screen uh, last fall to do the Matrix video for the ISCO Awards Banquet, and I wanted to get a little more use out of it. Am I recording this as well? Um, 
you know, actually, I don't think I am recording this. I think Facebook will record it. It'll be archived on the ESCA page. Uh, do you think more about the character, the role, rather than <clears throat> the actor in doing a scene from the film? Yeah, I would, I would say so, um, because the, the actors are inhabiting these characters, and they hold themselves in a certain way. They make certain expressions and uh, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing caricatures of their movie characters, and not so much of them, because you know I don't really know what they're like uh, in person. They're probably not like their characters. All right, here. So I've got the sort of rough thumbnails in. I'm pr pretty happy with Rick Moranis' character and Ellen Green, the Audrey character. Eh, you know, it's okay. It's it's very general. It's not super specific to her just yet, but uh, but I think it's in the right direction. So I've got the main exaggeration choices. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just zoom in on Rick Moranis here so I can focus more on him and then you know make the photo reference a little bigger because I kind of need to see it in a little more detail now. Uh -huh. uh, oh, what's my favorite scene from Little Shop of Horrors? Um, I mean, all the music, all the songs are just great. I don't know. Um, probably the intro for the dentist, Steve Martin's character. I just love that. You know, he's so cool in that. When I was, uh, you know, when that movie came out, I was like eleven or twelve, and I thought that was the epitome of cool. Of course, his character was a self-described sadist, but I didn't really know what that meant at the time. Just thought he was a funny dentist. Hello from Indiana, Chad. Thanks for joining. I used to live in Indiana myself, actually, when I was younger. I uh, lived in Carmel. Hi from Vancouver. All right. Thanks, Teresa, for joining us. Let me get rid of some of those earlier construction lines. Ooh, got someone from Dubai. Hello, Adil. Welcome.
There's no sound. Uh, I'm just not talking a lot. Maybe that's it. Can you hear me? Ray Shipman? Let me know if you can hear me. Everyone else seems to be able to hear me. Hey, Tassir, welcome to the group here. And just a quick tutorial on ear structure. If anyone ever gets confused about all the uh, planes inside the ear, just remember it's basically a, uh, a letter Y inside of a question mark. Like here's the outer lobe of the ear, here's the question mark, and here's the Y letter. Uh, and that just kind of explains the ridges of the ear. And uh, this is just a really, really rough sketch right now, so I'm not making it super anatomically correct, but. Uh, just a good little mnemonic device to remember. Oh, thanks, Manny. Yeah. Um, yeah, really? You found my live caricatures online back in 2000? Yeah, I guess I did have a website back then, but I can't remember what I might have. Uh, yeah, I guess I did have, yeah, right around that time is when I started my website. So, yeah. cool. Okay, so I think that's pretty uh, good for a rough sketch here. I think that's about all I want to do. And what I'm going to do after this is uh, decrease the opacity and do a tracing. But I want to get uh, Audrey's caricature figured out now before I do that and make that a little, take that from the level of a, what, this is just what I would consider a thumbnail sketch Oops. and uh, bring it up to rough sketch quality. Chris asks, uh, hi, Court. Thanks for this live demonstration. I was wondering to develop the ability to develop the ability to draw strong caricatures. Should I learn drawing fundamentals before starting your caricature course, or would your course be a good starting point for a drawing beginner? Um, I, I mean, having some drawing experience is, I think, required, uh, but not caricature necessarily. I created the course. The part one of the course is actually meant for people who have no familiarity whatsoever with caricatures. So it is a fundamental uh, series of lessons on uh, a step-by-step -step procedure for developing caricatures from a thumbnail sketch to a finish. And that's kind of what I'm doing right here today. I may not get to a finish because I only have like an hour, but uh, uh, yeah, it just you know, there's no prerequisites. I would say part one of the caricature course would be perfect for uh, what you're looking for. In case you guys don't know what I'm talking about, it's the uh, go to the Proco YouTube page. Uh, it's an online art school, essentially, and uh, most of the lessons or all the lessons are actually free on YouTube. 
Um, and then there's premium versions of the lessons on the Proco website, but you can just watch the free YouTube lessons if you want. And uh, I think get a lot of information out of it. Face a little bigger here. So now I can refine the shapes of like the nose here. It wasn't quite like I had it in my uh, thumbnail sketch. That was just a placeholder. I might want to make it look like they're singing to each other. Maybe I can make her mouth even more wide open because uh, they, you know, there's this one song, Suddenly Seymour, where they're both singing a duet facing each other. Maybe I can make it into that moment. Ah, my assistant just let me know. Steve said, what artists have influenced you the most? Um, you know, I have a lot of influences over different, like, genres of painting and art. You know, I have my caricature influences and fine art influences, portrait influences, landscape influences. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, the king of them all is John Singer Sargent, like most people probably. Uh, just even beyond portraits, just his style of painting where it's so economical, the way he lays down his brush strokes and it seems effortless, you know, saying so much with just a single stroke. Um, and there's, you know, I just think art peaked, well, not necessarily peaked, but it was just at a pinnacle in its, you know, heyday in the late 19th century when art, you know, Sargent and his contemporaries were around. Uh, and there's lots of great artists going on today, of course, but, uh, I always just go back to uh, those guys just because they're the classics and have stood the test of time. Uh, lately today, you know, I love artists like Jeremy Lipkin, uh, Nick Alm, uh, Sean Cheatham, you know, in the world of fine art. Um, there's, uh, you know, just a lot of caricature people, of course, you know, Kruger, you know, Seiler, Tom Richmond, you know, people that bring so many different things to the table and different styles. Uh, that I can get something from, uh, and hopefully that all gets incorporated into my uh, into my style somehow unconsciously. You know, a little bit of this artist, a little bit of that artist. All the teachers and people who influence you have you know leave their marks on you. I think whether consciously or unconsciously. I think her neck is too far back here. It's making it look like she's craning her neck forward. I'm gonna fix that here. Bring that neck here. Then I can bring the back of her neck in. There we go. That feels a little more natural of a pose. And that's what this, these stages are for. You know, I never just go right for a finish right from when I start. Uh, I try to refine and change things as I go, just because I know I can make it better if I sit back, look at it, and reassess what I'm doing. Can I paint this demo in the style of John Singer Sargent? <laughs> well, I don't think there'll be time for that today. I, I do plan on doing my own live stream on my YouTube channel uh, later, though, like Monday or Tuesday, I'll probably try to do it again. Um, and that's just, you know, my just Court Jones on YouTube. I don't have a ton of videos, but I'm trying to use this opportunity to uh, get more now that we're all sort of stuck at home. It's good to reach out to people and connect. Yeah, so her character in the movie has a bit of a push-up situation. 
Um, I'm trying to make it look natural, but also sort of caricatured. Uh, but she's sort of known for her, you know, her bosom in the movie. Uh, it's a, it's the result. There's a lot of you know visual gags and things related to it. You know, it's a movie from a different time, <laughs> the mid '80s. Okay, yeah, I'm pretty happy with how this is coming along. I think I could refine it a little bit more, but I'm going to move back over to uh, Seymour. And uh, for both these characters, I think I'll just dim down this layer so I can uh, do a proper tracing of it. Start a new layer on top of that. Uh, turn off that resize window checkbox. Okay. And this is what exactly what I'd be doing working on my own, not doing a demo in front of people. I just I do these successive tracings and layers <clears throat> where I refine it at each step. Here I'm gonna try to do a really clean line drawing. And then the line drawing here is what I would take into well, in Photoshop or projected on a canvas and then actually paint from that. So this one's going to be, you know, I may add shading, I may not, uh, since I'm pr I won't be able to get to the painting portion today, maybe I'll do a bit of crosshat shading to refine the forms a little bit, but I don't necessarily always do that, you know, I don't always do the shading. Uh, if I know I'm just going to take it to, you know, an oil painting or a digital painting stage right afterwards, just because it's, you know, just wasted time. The shading, though, can help sort of figure out the plane changes of the face, which can be instructive when you're actually doing the, uh, you know, the final painting. But uh, I do have to admit, I don't actually always resolve every step before I move to the painting. Uh, let's see. Hey, Tommy's on. All right. Hi, Tommy. Yes, I'm a stud. You're a stud, too, Tommy. Thomas, sorry. Um, my hand doesn't stick to the glass uh, sometimes. Uh, right now I'm actually wearing my digital gloves, so, you know, I'm drawing with protection here. Oh, yeah, you did mention the glove. Okay, not keeping track of all the uh, text here. Yeah. Uh, someone asked, uh, how do you keep the final from looking too stiff? Good question. Um, I mean, it's just, a lot of it's just dexterity with the pen or pencil that I'm using. So I'm just trying to um, <clears throat> uh, use a combination of straights and curves uh, just to give it a more dynamic look. In this stage, all the only language I have to speak with is my line. Uh, I'm not using really edges right now because I'm not using charcoal or, or brushes. So um, I want the forms to look organic, but not too organic. Uh, if it's too organic, too curvy, then it looks like it's lost all its structure. So I keep straighter lines in there for a sense of solidity and construction, but then I have to every now and then throw in a nice little C curve or an S curve into the stroke uh, to give that variety and that organic feeling. I would say overall though, my drawings are, at least I try to make them a series of short straight strokes. I think straight strokes in the early stage of a, of the process help maintain that sense of uh, construction and uh, solid forms because the more that you paint onto something the more that you work into it no matter what medium you always tend to lose those straight edges they just naturally fall away and your hand just likes to do rounded organic shapes 
uh, and I don't like to do that, get into that too soon. I try to res reserve that for the final stage because it does help. It does contribute to um, losing the sense of uh, solid form. Will I to um, let's see. Yeah, Sarah asks, you'd love to see how I take it to the painting stage digital. Um, yeah, um, I, I plan to. Um, I was just mentioning earlier, I'll probably do another live stream on my YouTube channel uh, on Monday or Tuesday. I did one last week, actually, that you can check out. It's up there, you know, archived. I uh, did a digital painting of Bill Murray, who was also in Little Shop of Horrors, actually, um, coincidentally. Uh, and that one's not finished. Uh, I just I got about halfway through it before my live stream ended. So, uh, so the, yeah, I do plan on finishing this one. And yeah, you uh, know, yeah, I'll be posting it to YouTube probably, um, and Facebook and my Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just shout out the questions. Um, uh, see, I think uh, the deal from Dubai asks, uh, do I draw comic style characters like Lobo, Hulk, uh, for events like Comic Con? Um, no, no, actually, I, I, I never gotten into comics at all. <laughs> um, it's not my art form. Um, I don't even read them. I don't know. I just never got into them as a kid, really. We just uh, didn't subscribe to comics, so I never got into it. Um, yeah, I like the art form, but yeah, it's just not my thing. Steve asks, in the way of cross-hatched work, how do you know when it gets too overdone? Because um, when you look at it, you'll be all mad. You're like, oh, I overdid it. <laughs> um, my, my personal rule of thumb is I don't like to actually do cross-hatching where I'm going back over the lines. I like just to do hatching, you know, in one direction. I like, I like the forms to be able to be described just with one direction. Um, meaning the, the weight of my lines, the length of the lines, the, how close they are to each other. If I have to go back over them perpendicularly to make them even darker, I feel like uh, I didn't do it, you know, adequately enough. Um, because to me, when it goes cross-hatching, um, it just, that's when it tends to look overworked to me. Um, other artists can pull that off. Maybe I just, I can't pull off the cross-hatching very well. Because I just think, that, I don't know, if the when you go perpendicular with the cross-hatching, it tends to look... Um, it's just too busy and I don't know, maybe even mechanical. If that makes any sense. I think that nose, the bridge of the nose is too high for his type here. I think I'm going to lower that bridge. The nose projects out here, but uh, and it doesn't, doesn't start quite so high. Hey, Alfred, thanks for joining us. Kendall asks, was Mad Magazine an influence? Uh, for sure. Um, you know, I did say I didn't ever subscribed to comics or comic books, but when I was, yeah, probably about 12 is when I first got into Mad Magazine and what I would buy them myself. So I didn't really subscribe, but I, uh, every time I went down to the convenience store and saw a new one, I would just buy it. <laughs> so yeah, I was influenced a lot by Mort Drucker and Jack Davis. Even though I don't draw in that style, I do some pen and ink work, you know, for fun and sometimes for clients, but that's not a major part of what I do. Question. Damon, are you more of a Seymour or uh, the dentist? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to think I'm the dentist, but I'm definitely the Seymour. Uh, in fact, I tend to, you know, make poor Debbie sing uh, suddenly Seymour with me on our karaoke, and she doesn't even really, really know it very well. 
she hates it. Uh, she's not even familiar with it, but she actually picked it up pretty well because she's a good singer and has a good ear. But uh, um, yeah, I forced Debbie to be Audrey, you know, only in a karaoke setting, though. Ignore Bob. What does Bob say? Is it normal to issue two checks when using a fluctuating COL index to combine short term and straight life policies in an overall insurance portfolio? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I should have ignored that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Bob asks, or Bob, Ben, sorry, asks, uh, any opinion on working with an iPad versus Wacom Companion? Um, well, I'm just more familiar with the Wacom Companion and Cintiq screens, so I would say the Companion. Um, I have an iPad Pro, and every now and then I sketch on it. Um, I just haven't devoted the time to really um, learning the programs or getting really comfortable with it. Like, I love my keyboard shortcuts. I love having the Alt key so I can, you know, tap down to get the color sampling tool or, or switch tools on the fly. Uh, with iPad, it's just a different set of mechanics and a different bit of muscle memory you have to use. Um, so I'm just not that as familiar with working on iPad. The uh, app on iPad, though, I do like the best so far is uh, Infinite Painter. Uh, it has really, really great brushes. Uh, it's pretty cheap and it just has a lot of cool stuff. I, I went to a, a, a workshop on it in uh, at the Lightbox Expo last fall is where I found out about it. And what's cool is they actually developed a Proco pencil, which mimics Stan Prokopenko's, you know, charcoal pencil, uh, which is a, basically just the Watts Atelier charcoal pencil, which is just a charcoal pencil. But the way we hold it, they mimic that look pretty well. So if you want to do a simulated uh, like charcoal life drawing, I really recommend Infinite Painter using the Proco pencil. Record all the code. Don't use keyboard. Okay. Uh, uh, please be sure to join you at the webinar LN20, like LN15, Cynthia Collins. Okay. Um, also, Luigi Strangarella. Oh, hey, Luigi. Glad to see you're watching. Any good questions coming in? No, someone asked. Uh, well, no, I, <laughs> oh, I think uh, everyone's at home. Uh, Stan is self isolating like we all are, I guess. Everyone from the Proco offices, I think, are all working from home these past couple of weeks. All right. So, as far as the line drawing go, I think that's sort of finished enough where I could. Uh, Take it into, well, it isn't Photoshop, but take it to a, uh, you know, start painting it essentially. So I'm going to go ahead and move back over to Audrey here. See if I can uh, do the final drawing for her. I'm actually going to make her a little taller than Seymour, too. She's uh, taller than him in the movie. And there she is. Um, Sergio Mateos asks, what made you decide to square off his nose? Uh, what made me decide to square off Seymour's nose? Um, I don't know. It's just it's just my shorthand, like how I draw. It's just part of my technique. Um, you know, just uh, 
you know, in, in a final, like I was saying earlier, in the final painting, things tend to round themselves off on their own. Um, so I try to keep things sort of straighter and more mechanical looking earlier on because it helps give a better sense of uh, solid structure to the face. I mean, it's something I don't always consciously do. Maybe it's just a habit or a tendency, but uh, I think that's why, because I, I've learned for, you know, in my experience that it's best for me personally to keep things straighter and more blocky in the beginning. Have I ever drawn and given a caricature to a celebrity I have met? Um, yeah, at parties. Um, I've, I've drawn some celebrities at events. What's that? Yeah, I'll keep drawing a couple stories. You know, I live in San Diego, so every now and then I do events up in L.A. And um, let's see, what was... Yeah. Uh, so one of the weirdest events I ever worked was a, sort of a celebrity event. There were quite a few celebrities there, but it was the, the wake for Tammy Faye Baker, the televangelist from the 80s. And uh, uh, she uh, lived in Palm Springs, so I went up there for that. And I guess for her funeral, her wake, she wanted a big party with all her friends. And she made a lot of friends in entertainment. So there were people there like Cloris Leachman, some lady from Dallas, Larry King showed up. Um, but one of the fellows I got to draw was an interesting guy by the name of Ron Jeremy, a certain adult film star. And uh, and he was really funny and really charming, actually. Um, I found out he actually, before he got into adult films, he uh, was a teacher for special education. I think in like New York, he has a degree in special ed. So that's very surprising. Um, see, another one that I like to mention was, uh, one of my favorite events I did was for Ryan Gosling, actually, on the set of Crazy Stupid Love. Uh, he just paid for me to come there and draw, like, the cast and crew on one of the last days of filming. So I got to, you know, draw, like, Emma Stone and, uh, Julianne Moore and Steve Carell. And then Ryan actually hired me for a few other events, uh, uh, over the next year or so for different movie projects he worked on. I wish that was still going on. That was a pretty fun set of experiences. So, you know, I drew them right there and then, um, these celebrities. So they weren't like my illustration work. They weren't really pieces that I was super proud of. They were just quick sketches, uh, but they seemed to like them. Uh, there was another event that I heard about secondhand. I was actually hired by a company uh, to do an illustration of a certain late night talk show host uh, for an event that he was gonna be working at at some college or something. And so I did this new caricature of him with a very large chin uh, and when the guy showed up on site to, uh, you know, to perform and see everything, he was furious. He did not appreciate the caricature whatsoever and demanded they all be removed. I won't say who it is, but, uh, you might be able to guess. Um, you know, you think a person like that would have, you know, who's a comedian would have a pretty good sense of humor about certain things, but I guess not. But I was pretty proud of that, you know, I, that I heard that he was angry with it, you know, because I, I thought it was a pretty good caricature. So it didn't rattle my uh, confidence or anything. It just, uh, uh, you know, you always get a little sense of pride when you get a reject you know, from, as we all learned from Joe Bloom's book, rejects can be some of the times the best sketches. Oh, didn't I draw Hemsworth before he played Thor? Yeah, that was on one of the Ryan Gosling gigs, actually. It was on a, a chartered fishing boat. Um, there was, like a, I guess, a birthday party for the manager of all these actors, and Chris Hemsworth was one of the actors, and he was there with his brother Liam. It was right before Thor came out. Uh, I drew him and his brothers. And, uh, you know, it was an okay sketch. But, uh, but I got to chat with him a little bit about it. And surprisingly, he wasn't huge in person. I mean, he definitely was cut. You know, he had some muscles, but he wasn't, like, gigantic or anything. He just sort of, uh, average, well, taller than me, but average size still. Did you ask him who was in the film? <laughs> um, I would just ask him, like, oh, he's, you know, I, every person who sat down for me that day on the boat was like, uh, I just said, oh, so what do you do? Are you an actor? Do you work in the industry? And, and then, you know, just you get into the conversation with him. So, oh, yeah, I was just in a movie called Thor. 
who'd you play? Thor. <laughs> so I was like, oh, cool. Let's see. Laurel asked, do you feel nervous when drawing celebrities? Yeah, definitely. For sure. It's like just way more pressure is on and I almost always fold under pressure like that. And I always do a sketch that is definitely not my best work because, uh, you know, when you get in your own head about caricature, worrying about the result too much or about flattering the person or whatever it may be that gives you a mental hang up, it takes you out of the process and you don't make your best decisions. At least I don't. So when every time I've drawn a celebrity live, it just generally turns out pretty bad. And I'm not being modest. I mean, it's not definitely not my best work. Okay, just got rid of the. Uh, uh, pre-sketch layer and just take a look what we got here. Cool. Well, let me uh, reposition this on the canvas a little bit here. Yeah, bring her height up just a little bit more. Steve asks, what are my go-to tools for live events? Um, uh, digital. I almost always do digital now. I hardly ever do any traditional uh, character sketching anymore, but a few times that I do, um, I'm still using the um, chart pack uh, fine tip markers. Uh, I just like them best. I don't care for Copics. Um, the brush tips on those are too soft and floppy, and I've, I'm really very heavy-handed when I draw, and it's really hard for me to get thin lines. What about Marquettes? Um, Marquettes. No, um, I mean, they're, no, yeah, the new Marquettes, even with new bullet tip, I'm just, I'm not a fan. Uh, they're just different than they used to be. I used to like them, but I just haven't liked any Marquettes uh, since they uh, reformulated the tip. Jaime asks, do I use the same approach to drawing live caricatures? Uh, the same approach as I do here? No, absolutely not. <laughs> um, for one, I don't do profiles when doing live, but I don't do a pre-sketch at all. Um, I just do the outside of the face with my marker and just draw the jaw, the chin, the ears, and then I move inside the face. And yes, Audrey's body isn't quite working out here just yet because I'm kind of inventing it. Because I don't want to do the dress she has on in the uh, reference photo. There's another dress she wears throughout most of the movie, a little black dress with a white bolero jacket. So I'll probably try to draw that. I'll look at that reference for that later and see what I can do with it. And you know what else I want to do here? Let's actually... <laughs> Uh, if you're not familiar with the movie, here's the Audrey 2. Uh, he names the plant after her that he finds. Which is just kind of funny because it's just a stupid clunky name, you know, for a character, Audrey 2. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's always carrying the plant around, especially when it's younger. So I'm 
we can throw Audrey 2 in there, I think. If you're not familiar with the movie, the plant, uh, you know, demands that uh, Seymour feed it blood so it can grow big. And then later on, it develops the ability to uh, talk and it manip manipulates him into doing its will. <laughs> so. so. A little smile on his face here. Trying to draw the plant from the side based on memory because I don't really have a good photo of it with the right angle. Basically, it looks like a cabbage with a mouth. I don't know, it also kind of looks like something else, but I think that might have been in you know a subliminal thing, or maybe in, maybe it was intentional on part of the filmmakers. <laughs> Uh, and I won't have a lot of time to really resolve this Audrey sketch. I think right now it's just too much going on with all this little vegetation and leaves. Uh, but I do do a lot of still lifes, at least I have over the years. And I think uh, artists should practice all sorts of different disciplines because you never know when it's going to help you in your caricature work. If uh, you know, you might have a plant to draw one day, or a landscape, or an interior scene that just that the job requires. So the more of that kind of stuff you do. On your own in your spare time, even though it's not necessarily your area of interest, the more, the stronger you're going to be with your, uh, with your illustration and fine artwork with caricature. Let's see, let's make the plant a little smaller, I think. So in the final, it'll be basically right there, but I'll have to refine that a little more later. <laughs> Great work, Court Yarmi. Using so many views, even without having to show your belly button. I agree. No one wants to see that. Uh, Sebastian asks, I was going to say, I think there's another resemblance for the plant, but yeah, like I said, I think it's uh, uh, subtly intentional on the part of the people who designed it. I mean, if you look at like the plot of the movie, the it's this, you know, he's sort of this nerdy guy who never can find love and the girl he likes ignores him and until he gets this amazing and interesting plant. And then everyone thinks he's cool. And then he has to sort of do the plants bidding like he's a slave to it. It's a, it's a subtle, I think, message about uh, gender roles, masculinity. I don't know. Maybe someone can write a thesis about it, but uh, it's, it's definitely, yeah, suggestive, I think, especially with the shapes. All right, so let's take a look here. Yeah, ever since someone commented about squaring off Seymour's nose, now it's bugging me. I think I do have to round it off. You know, it's actually good to, uh, you know, have all these eyes on it at once. People can help help me develop the caricature as I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just got the word that I can go a little bit longer on this. Uh, if you guys want to stick with me, I maybe go another 25, 30 minutes or so. And what I think I might do is actually do a, uh, a block in of the colors uh, and just actually start painting and see what I can do with that. And uh, I obviously won't be able to finish it, but maybe I can finish it over on my YouTube page uh, in a few days uh, if you guys want to check back in with that.
So let me go ahead and actually save this in case anything happens. I don't want to lose the sketch. So. Yeah, save your work. Steve says, Jack Nicholson was in the 1960s version. That's right. Um, I once caught that movie on late night TV. Uh, the 80s movie, Little Shop of Horrors, was based on the stage musical, which was based on the Roger Corman film from the 60s, which was just a terrible, terrible B-movie with the same exact plot, but it, that wasn't a musical. And uh, Jack Nicholson played the Bill Murray character, uh, the, uh, the dental patient who actually liked the torture and the feeling of the pain. It was kind of a fun role for Jack Nicholson. All right, so I don't need to see the faces in detail here, so let me shrink them down a bit. Got to reorient my uh, screen area. One of the first things I always like to do when uh, starting a digital painting or any painting uh, is uh, staining the canvas or just bringing it, uh, you know, bringing the middle value over the entire area uh, because it helps me judge my skin tones and all the other values a little more accurately to start in the middle. If you start on white, it tends to influence your decisions to make uh, flesh colors and every color too light, lighter than they're, they're really at. And uh, it just provides a nice background too for your paint strokes to have color underneath them and have a little bit of color vibration. So I'm actually going to do some local color stains, uh, which is just what I would do with uh, oil painting on canvas too, is just uh, get some darks in places and some brighter colors in places. Let's start with some darks here. And I'm working underneath the line art layer because I want to you know, preserve my lines. I'm just switching paint sizes at this point, or just relying on pressure somehow. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I switched to a different pen to a different uh, brush tool actually in Photoshop. Uh, this is my uh, general round painting brush. And the only setting it really has on it is just that it uh, becomes less opaque with light pen pressure. How often do I run into creator's block and uh, how do I deal with it? Um, yeah, when I don't feel like drawing, um, I don't draw. <laughs> I mean, I go do something else. Uh, I mean, when I'm working, I mean, I just, it's like a job. You just sit down and do it whether you like it or not, or whether you're in the mood or not. If you have a you know deadline, you just have to do it. But um I do take frequent breaks where I'll just go watch, you know, an internet, you know, video, something on something on YouTube, like watch people play Legend of Zelda, <laughs> or I'll go down to the karaoke machine and do that, or go out on a bike ride. And, um, usually that freshens me up. I just, I'm the kind of person that does need a lot of uh, mental breaks because I get, you know, really intense focus for like half an hour or an hour, and then I need to stop and just uh, recharge. Are you drawing directly on the tablet? Uh, I can't see it. Yeah, my drawing directly on the tablet. Yes, I have a big 22-inch Cintiq 
right here. And um, yeah, so it's just as acts as a second screen on my monitor, or it acts as a second screen on my computer system here. Um, Sarah asks if, De Debbie oh, Debbie, sorry, Debbie Schaefer asks, do I start, when I do a canvas painting, do I start digitally and then project it? Uh, is that the question? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, most of the times. When I'm doing a caricature, for sure, um, I can draw them on paper with pencil, but then I have that extra step of I need to import it into the machine, you know, scan it or photograph the sketch. Um, uh, so I just prefer to do most of my sketching just digitally because it's easier to get that over to the canvas because I have a digital projector. Uh, I don't like drawing and inventing things directly on a canvas just because I don't trust myself. You know, I like to do lots of development in the sketch phase. So um, before I, you know, put anything on a canvas, I want to make sure it's all figured out. Everything is I'm totally happy with the likeness and the drawing uh, before I even go near a canvas because I don't want to waste that time and waste that material. And it's, it's harder to erase on a canvas or on a board that you gessoed than it is digital. So yeah, I always, I, I work like an illustrator, right? Just work in stages and steps. So I try to make it as easy on myself as possible. Okay, so I've uh, you know, got a basic stain on the faces here. It's pretty rudimentary, but I'm going to go to a layer right above that now and uh, start working opaquely. So I won't, I'll be working above the line art layer. So what I like to do next in that this situation is actually uh, put in my darkest darks so that they, uh, you know, so I don't lose my drawing too soon. Um, if I start painting opaquely, I'm going to cover up those lines, um, but with you know, with this here, I can, um, the drawing gets, like I said, preserved just for a longer period of time before it disappears in the other paint strokes. And I'm still just using my simple round Photoshop brush here. No fancy brushes yet. I like to have a little bit of color in my darkest darks. I usually like to make them reddish black rather than a pure black. It's just a habit I picked up from oil painting. I never like to use just pure black on a canvas. Just like you don't want to use pure white. Pure white is just as dangerous as pure black. Bob East asks, do you listen to music or have a movie on while working? Bob asks, do I uh, listen to music while working or watch a movie? Um, yeah, music or podcasts or, yeah, just it's something audio. I can't have a movie on or I will constantly be distracted and look at the movie. <laughs> so it just has to be like yeah, an audio book or music or a podcast or something. What's your favorite music right now? That's my question. Uh, your question, like personally? Yes. Um, you know, I don't have any favorite music. I mean, I when I'm listening, it's uh, I mean, I usually find myself just listening to sort of ambient soundscapes like that they play on YouTube because they're sort of non-distracting. Uh, where it's like you know, relax with binaural tones or something. Um, other than you know, every now and then I do listen to uh, you know, just pop music like a lot of stuff from the '80s. 70s rock music 
So a couple questions. Do you prefer the Wacom stylus to the iPad Pro Apple Pencil? Uh, do I prefer the Wacom stylus to the Apple um, Pencil on iPad? Uh, yeah, and that's just because I'm more familiar with it. I'm sure the Apple Pencil was great. I have one. I just barely ever use it. Um, I, th I think there still is more, you know, pressure sensitivity and control that you get with the Wacom. I don't know the stats on it, but uh, uh, yeah, I just because I use it most, that's why I prefer it. Nothing wrong with the Apple Pencil that I know of. It's just, um, you know, it's, it's what works for me. Okay, now it's, now I'm actually getting into the painting part, you know, the real meat of the painting. Where I'm trying to figure out what values go where, and uh, sculpting the planes of the face. Which Wacom are you using? Which Wacom am I using? Right now I'm just on the 22-inch um, HD um, Cintiq, connected to my PC. I'm going to zoom back in on uh, Seymour here so I can see his face a little better since I'm now painting the planes of his face. Of course, I try to use as big a brush as I can for any given area. If I go too small with the brush too soon, you know, it just encourages me to work on the details before I really should. Interesting. So I'm not sure what a Bolton, right, Wacom, what portable Wacom do you use? Someone's asking what's my portable setup for my Wacom. Well, I use the Mobile Studio Pro. Uh, that's what I bring to my live events. What size is that? Oh, I use the 16 inch. 16 inch mobile studio. I love the big screen size. I'm always, I wish it could be even bigger. I just, I love it. Don't like drawing on small screens if I can help it. I feel a little uh, claustrophobic on the iPad actually, I think that may be one of the reasons why I don't like, you know, why I don't instinctively go over to it. I mean, it's nice because it's portable and lightweight, but um, when I'm working events, I really like to have all that screen real estate. And the size isn't an issue transporting it, you know, you just throw it in a backpack and it doesn't have to be super, super portable. I mean, it doesn't have to be super tiny to be portable. Uh, here's a good one from okay. Don Langren. Do you ever pull the colors from the reference photo or do you always choose them by mm -hmm. eye? Um, I try to make it a habit. Uh, the question was, do I always pick my colors in manually or grab them from the reference photo? I'm a big advocate for mixing them yourself, uh, meaning going to the Photoshop color picker window and actually selecting the color. Um, you know, I can't say that 100% of the time I I do that, you know, just if I'm in a hurry sometimes for a big job and a client is really wanting accuracy, I might sample from the photo, but only just a couple key colors to get me started on the right foot, but I don't like doing it. Because um, I, I was trained traditionally first uh, to do caricature, um, to paint, you know, with, uh, oils and gouache and you just you have to learn to mix on the fly be able to see the value and saturation of a color and to be able to reproduce it if you always just select your colors from the reference photo uh you're never gaining that skill that this essential skill because every now and then you'll find yourself in a situation where you have to work from a particular photo given to you say by the client and you don't have a choice and it's maybe it's terrible lighting maybe it's all orange uh, taken under warm lighting and you need to make it look realistic or like a full color painting. Uh, if you don't have the skills to improvise and judge colors on your own, uh, you will just be sampling colors from a very bad photo and you'll be kind of stuck because you don't have that good fundamental skill under your belt. 
and it has happened. It happens happens more often than you think. So um, yeah, it's just always always good habit to learn to mix colors manually. You, you just learn so much about how to solve problems with color. And then on the second the second half of that is actually you develop a color style, kind of like you have a drawing style, the way you indicate certain strokes. Well, certain artists have their distinct color uh, footprints, you know, that they leave behind. And you might like a certain artist's work because of how they use color. That's the reason I like certain artists myself. Like, I just, I love how, well, you know, I love everything about Sargent, but you can tell, like, oh, that's a Sargent painting the way he colored it, or, or a Zorn painting because, well, Zorn used a limited palette in a lot of his paintings um, and that was that kind of came his signature was the the look of the color of his paintings and um, you know it doesn't always produce the most you know accurate results it doesn't look like the photo necessarily uh, but that's a good thing I think if you ask me it's, it doesn't have to look like the photo it just has to look good it has to look good as a painting all on its own because years down the road no one's going to be comparing the photo up against your painting people are just going to be looking at your painting and judging whether or not they like it whether it has a distinct personality whether it's consistent with your other paintings you know where the colors you know are the colors similar to how you use colors in other compositions i think consistency in color is a is a good trademark of your style Another question about the iPad versus the lock on. Do you paint with this in the iPad? Which do you prefer? Not on the screen. Um, well, I'll, I'll answer on the screen. Okay. Uh, Rick Wright asks, do I paint and illustrate like this in my iPad? Which do you prefer? Yeah, we talked about this a little, little earlier, but um, no, I don't. I don't really paint on my iPad that much. Uh, I sketch on it sometimes when I'm, you know, if I just bring it with me somewhere, I'll sketch a little bit. But uh, yeah, I'm... Um, I'm just more comfortable in the Windows environment with my keyboard in front of me. You can hook a keyboard up to an iPad. Would that change your mind? Um, hooking a keyboard up to an iPad change my mind? No, maybe. But I mean, I got this big 22-inch screen, and if I'm in my studio, I'm gonna default to the bigger screen. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, nothing against the iPad. I just don't have a reason really to go to it. Uh, honestly, I don't love sketching like out in the world. Um, you know, just if I'm sitting somewhere in a doctor's office or mechanics, you know, I don't kill my time by sketching. Um, I just like to be comfortable in my studio when I sketch. What do you do if you're waiting at the mechanic? If I'm waiting in the mechanic, I usually just read Facebook or uh, do a crossword. I can't do art all the time. So Debbie Schaefer wants to know, are you still painting underneath the drawing now? Uh, no, I'm not painting underneath the drawing. I'm on top of the line art layer. So, why is that? Uh, and why is that is because um, I want to cover up the lines. I want it to look like a painting, not like a colored drawing. So uh, yeah, at a certain point, you got to get away from the line art and cover it up. It's 12.15. Okay. It looks like um, I'll just go another 10 or 15 minutes, I think, if people want to stick with me. That's great. Part of the painting process, too, is figuring out color temperature. You know, that's just working with color in general is a problem, but a lot of people don't put enough cools in uh in people's faces in general uh because you tend to be a little scared of them or make you worry about making the colors look a little too muddy uh but properly placed colors at the right 
you know, color temperature, and if they're the right value, you can get away with just about any color you want, as long as it's not distracting from the overall composition. So, like, I'm going to put a little more blue in his beard than really appears, because I think that tends to make things look a little more, it'll make it look a little more interesting, and uh, a little more realistic, and just give it some variation that it needs, to, just to have just visual interest. Because if everything's a shade of orange or brown, uh, it's just, it's not as interesting. And the further you proceed in a painting like this, and the more colors you get on the face, the more you don't need to go back to the Photoshop uh, color picker window. Um, you can just sample colors from the composition itself. So that's another one of the reasons I like to do some a wide range of color temperatures on the face and get a full range of values in there relatively quickly, uh, because then I can sample more quickly from the, the painting itself, not from the reference photo, just the painting. So right now, are you just doing the dark blocking instead of shaper by asking? Um, no, and right now I'm not really blocked. I mean, you or could... Are you doing highlights? Um, I'm just painting right now, yeah. So I'm, I'm going a little bit faster than I might on my own. Like, I might not go to the highlights so quickly uh, normally, but I know I have limited time, and I want to say, like, maybe bring this nose up to a finish so it looks a little more interesting. So I have, like, a little more highlight there. Nyman asks, what is the size of the canvas and file size? What is the size of my canvas and file size? Um, I think this is a 12 by 16 inch Photoshop document at 300 uh, pixels per inch. Oh no, 12. I, no, I, I realized when I opened it, I needed to make it a little wider. So it's actually, I think, I think it's 12 by 20. Is that right? Yeah, something around there. Um, the largest usually I ever work is about 16 by 20 inches. Because um, you just don't need to make it much larger than that. If it's just work for a print, you're going to make a print out of it or send it to a client. Um, but that's big enough, too, to get enough detail in there where you can zoom in on the eyes and get the highlights on the eyes. But yeah, that's usually around where I work, between 11 by 14 inches to about 16 by 20 on the large size.
Yeah, I tend to err on the side of uh, painting things a little darker at first, and then I lighten them up as I go. That's just another habit I got into from oil painting, I guess, because in oil paints, if you put a, a color that's just too light or too much white on it early on, it's real hard to paint over it later. Just the white contaminates everything. So uh, I usually, you know, start a little darker and build up to my lights on top of that. And that ends up looking pretty good because when you start painting a la prima wet into wet on top of light colors on top of darker, it, it creates a nice textural feel too, where you can build up slowly to your highlights. Do you prefer oil painting or digital painting? Do I prefer oil or? Question. Oh, Debbie asks if I prefer oil or digital painting. I, I prefer oils. Um, I mean, I love digital painting for the practicality of it, and I often do client work digitally just because it's it's the smart way to go because if you need to edit it, you can. It's, it just works faster than oil painting usually. Um, but when I'm working on for my own benefit, which are just, you know, if, I, if it's just for myself or if a piece that I really care about, I'll do it in oils because I like to have an original oil painting hanging, hanging around. Yeah, yeah, lots of my oil paintings just hanging around. <laughs> Marco Antonio Garcia asks, what do you think people think about digital art versus traditional oil? What do you think people think about digital art versus traditional? Um, eh, that's a big subject. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know, I can't speak to what other people think, <laughs> but um, generally, I mean, I think it's artists appreciate the medium, being able to have that medium available to themselves. Um, what about the general public? The general public, I don't think, I don't think the general public gives too much thought about the difference between digital and traditional. They usually just, you know, the really uninformed person just out in the public will think digital art is just where you take a photo and put a filter over it or something. I, I'll be working live at events doing digital caricatures and people have been waiting in line watching me the entire time and then they still sit down and ask, so what do you take like a photo of me and then stretch it? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm literally just drawing it. They, there's a big misunderstanding by a lot of people, a big, you know, high level of ignorance about what digital art is. Because most people are just familiar with, you know, what their phone does and how, you know, photo filters work. Uh, so, you know, it's up to us to educate them. Um, you know, I think traditional art is just, you know, the common perception about that is it's going to stand, stand the test of time. It'll always be around. Um, and it's always going to be more valuable because an original painting is just always more valuable than a print or a digital file. And me personally, when I see people doing artwork online, uh, that they share with the world. I'm always more impressed when it's a beautiful traditional painting than a beautiful digital painting. Because I know so many things are a lot easier with digital. Uh, certain effects you can do, you know, you can just work without consequences. But a digital, I'm sorry, a traditional painting in whatever medium, whether it's oils or gouache, charcoal or acrylics, there's no, you know, there's no cheating. There's no, <laughs> well, there are certain ways to cheat still, but um, it takes a lot more um, training and experience to work well with traditional uh, materials. So I'll always have a higher place of esteem for uh, traditional art. Millie was asking, how many hours would you say an average commission caricature portrait would take you, or how many hours would an, it ideally take? Uh, how long would a... Uh, an average commission character take me, uh, and how much, how long ideally? You have to break that out. Just... Yeah, I, I do different uh, mediums. Uh, so I do watercolors for people. I do ink drawings for people. I do digital paintings for people. Um, ideally, you know, I'll just stick with digital, I guess, you know, in this kind of style, just because that's what we're talking about or that's what I'm showing. Um, ideally, I could do a head and, port head and shoulders caricature portrait in about three or four hours. But that rarely ever happens. I would say it's probably more like five or six, uh, depending on the subject. And then the more stuff that they want in the picture, the more complicated and longer it takes. So um, uh, I usually do stretch out my commissions over a couple of days, though. You know, I'll, I'll work two or three hours one day, then put it down, and then come back to it a couple of days later, if I have the time. Uh, 
and then uh because the more time you allow yourself to sit with a project the longer you'll be able to be critical of it come back to it fresh the next day and see what you might want to change about it so i hope that answers your question of course you know if clients ask you how long it takes too you don't really want to necessarily just say oh it takes me three hours or four hours because then they'll say oh it's only worth three hours of your time then you should maybe only get 50 bucks for it you know to be able to do you know a three hour painting you have to work 20 or 30 years to get really good at that so it takes three hours plus 30 years you know if you want to be technical about it and does that three hours include sketching and thumbnails or just painting oh you know that you know when i say that three hours it usually just includes that i'm just thinking about the painting time not the sketching time because the sketching could go on and on forever too if they're a picky client or if it's an illustration for you know a company and they need it to look a certain way because it's going to represent their brand there's usually a lot of back and forth in the development phase so you charge more for illustrations a lot of times than commissions or maybe you don't i don't know but i think i do <laughs> So what am I doing no, now? I'm, um, I'm getting a question from the uh, studio here. What am I doing now? Um, just painting. <laughs> um, just uh, going back and forth between light and dark. Just uh, figuring things out. It's just like a math problem. Just figuring it out. Did you see my question? Yeah. Steve Nyman asks, do you prefer private commissions or working with art directors? Um, do I prefer private commissions or working with art directors? You know, it depends on the art director, but in general, I think yeah, it, it depends, again, what the exact project is. If it's a caricature of someone, like for a, their magazine or newspaper, uh, they're usually not as critical as a private client would be about, you know, me drawing their mother. So just about anything I do for an illustration client is fine by them as long as it is the right size and it looks like the person. And, and representative of my quality of work, they're easier to work with than a private commission client. Uh, I almost never have any revisions to do for caricatures when it's for a uh, publication. Uh, because yeah, they're not personally attached to the subject. They just, if they want me to do a caricature of a political figure, they just want a caricature of the political figure and they're not gonna be, you know, I don't have to worry about flattering anybody. <laughs> so I generally like that a little bit more, but then there's other clients where I do something for them where it has to be very precise and exacting, like it's for a, uh, Maybe it's not a caricature. Maybe it's an illustration for their dog food brand or or uh, just some other kind of product design. And they're very, very picky about it. So it depends on the type of job. OK, and I haven't really switched over to any new brushes. Uh, I do often use brushes as part of my um, it's part of my normal process here. So uh, there we go. I, I got a streaky brush here that, you know, does something like that. that that's pretty cool. That's good for hair sometimes. Um, but I'm looking actually for a textured brush. Yeah, this one here is I, uh, I scanned one of my favorite canvas linens. And it has that linen texture sort of baked into it. And that just helps create sort of the, the illusion of brush strokes and the illusion of a canvas green. I don't use it too much uh, because it can get a little overwhelming sometimes or it looks a little too repetitive of a texture. But it's nice to throw it in every now and then to uh, keep the painting from looking too fake and digital. Okay, you know what? It's about 1230. I think I'd probably better call it quits here so you guys can take a break and get ready for our next uh, live streamer. Who is uh, is that Maria? Maria, Maria Picasso Piquet is coming up next. Uh, so I hope you guys will watch her because I'm going to. Uh, any other last minute questions here? 
Uh, Ken asks, the co that concept of experience is so tough to explain to people. The art is worth more than just the time you put into it. Exactly, yeah, that's, it's, it's something that's really hard to explain. Jaime asks, do I sell my own custom brushes? No. Um, no, I mean, a lot of the brushes I use are actually downloaded from other artists. And at this point, I can't really remember who I got them from. So I'd be like reselling theirs and that's not right. So um, I think one of the, my favorite brushes that I use or some of my favorite brushes are sold by uh, Peleng, P-E-L-E-N-G. Uh, his name is Sergei Kolosov. And I think he's on Patreon. I think you can actually buy his brushes. Uh, Kyle Webster's brushes that come with Photoshop are actually amazing. So I use a lot of his as well. So, uh, and I do make some of my own, but they're not anything really fancy. Uh, anyway, I'll go ahead and zoom out here on my drawing. So it's, it's got a start, got a decent start. I'm definitely going to finish this because I want to see this through to the end. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to finish it on my own live stream uh, later in the week on my YouTube channel. And that's just Court Jones on YouTube. Um, but also if you want to follow me on Instagram at, at Court Jones Artist. Uh, so with that, um, Thanks, and uh, I'll see you all on Facebook. Bye, guys.